Today, I wanted to just look at the EUIC 2023 results and kind of analyze the metagame and some of the deck lists and the decks in general. Uh, I think this metagame is so cool to analyze because of the variety of cards and strategies uh, that are going on here. Uh, a really diverse field of decks and really diverse standings as well. There were seven different archetypes in the top eight of the EUIC 2023. So, uh, yeah, I think this is a good time to be playing the Pokemon TCG for several reasons. Uh, a lot of the cards are cheap. Most of the decks we'll look at today, I think, are under $100 to build from scratch. Uh, and also, the metagame's really diverse. It looks like it's really rewarding people who are thinking deeply about the decks and cards that are being played and that are um, really mastering the creative deck lists that they're building. So we'll see that uh, in day two, Lugia was like 20, almost 30% of the day two field, uh, but it only had two, it had two placements in top eight, which that that's fair. You know, that's pretty fair. And then it had uh, zero top 16s outside of the top eight. So by no means did Lugia dominate this tournament at all. I mean, I think what this really tells us is that players thought Lugia would be a safe ride to high placements, and so there were a lot of people that played it, and it did make it into day two, but the Lugia in the current metagame, in the Scarlet and Violet format, uh, this Lugia can actually be beaten this lugia can actually be countered uh and played around a little bit whereas the old lugia with radiant charizard and amazing rare evil tall aurora energies stoutland with powerful colorless energies powerful colorless in general uh that lugia that form of it was just so so strong and this version is is it is not that so Rest assured, although almost 30% of day two was Lugia, a lot of those players did not finish too well. So they made it into day two, but um, it was not the deck to win the tournament, it looks like. Lost Zone Box, there's two variants. There's the Sableye Charizard variant, and then there's the Radiant Greninja with Mirage Gates variant. The Radiant Greninja with Mirage Gates variant can also be further broken down into does it play Far Seal Stone or does it play Sky Seal Stone? And it looks like here the Far Seal Stone variants were the way to go, uh, but we'll look on that a little later. Hisuian Gudra, almost as much of a percentage in Day 2 as Lost Zone Box, actually. Um, and Hisuian Gudra started looking like a really good play for EUIC to me. Um, the week leading up to EUIC, that week, maybe like a few days before, I started thinking, you know... There, there's going to be a good bit of top players playing Guja Lost Zone because everybody disrespects this deck. And like we've seen from Japan that it is good. Um, and, you know, they've been playing it for a while now in this format. They were even playing it in the last format. Uh, so I did expect a suing Guja Lost Zone to show up. Mew VMAX is just, you know, you, you can't go wrong with Mew VMAX. It's really strong, powerful, fast, consistent, and you can also disrupt your opponent. Uh, Gardevoir decks, people were really, really unsure about Gardevoir going into this weekend, uh, so we'll definitely talk about that, and uh, yeah, so Arceus, there were a good bit of Arceus decks as well, Giratina, this is Lost Zone Giratina, uh, Lost Zone Giratina did not perform too well, it had a nice two, day two showing, but it didn't convert well within day two, uh, Maridon decks, uh, there was just one in top eight, and then the rest did pretty poorly, uh, but I, I think Maridon is a solid deck, and it's that kind of deck that, uh, it's an aggressive deck. It reminds me of kind of like, uh, Buzzwool GX decks, um, not really for how the, the attacks work or anything in that nature, but, uh, more so because, like, you could just pop off with Max Elixirs, uh, and start getting strong attacks in early game. Maybe more similar to, uh, the old Turbo Dark Rai EX, but... It is a very fast deck, and it can overpower, like, control decks, it can overpower Gardevoir decks um, if it takes off early and never stops that pressure. Uh, so, I think it's a solid deck, and I'm not really surprised to see somebody make a hot run into top 8 with it. Um, we have Inteleon Rapid Strike, there were two of those, and there's also one Rapid Strike 
Urshifu without Inteleon. Uh, there was one Control, which was Sander Wojcik, and one Snorlax Stall. So the difference between the Inteleon Rapid Strike, we've seen these decks from Japan already um, with the Rapid Strike Urshifu that Magnus Peterson played. Um, this was this is a very interesting deck. Um, I actually want to play it at some point on this channel. Magnus Peterson, I also believe, played um Arceus Rapid Strike Urshifu with single strike mustard beedrill uh last year, I think at EUIC, or it, it was another European tournament. But uh yeah, Magnus plays some very interesting decks that I'm quite fond of. So let's uh let's look at Gardevoir. So Tord Reklev played Gardevoir, and he got second place, losing to Alex Shemansky in the finals. Uh, Tord had a couple of interesting things about his deck. One, he plays four Professor's Research. Now, here's the thing. You don't really want to play Professor's Research past, like, turn three most of the time with this deck. Maybe past turn four, but, like, turn one going second, you'll love to see Professor's Research. Turn two, you'll love to see Professor's Research. And then after that, you're typically trying to build up a little bit of a larger hand um and there's going to be resources you don't always want to get rid of uh but professor's research is just a the strongest drawing card in the game right you discard your hand and draw seven um a lot of players were including myself trying to build gardevoir without professor's research because of you know, it's an evolution deck. We have Curly as we don't want to discard. We have Guard of REX we don't want to discard. We have other tech supporters and stadiums and tools we don't want to discard. Uh, but Tord was able to make such a deep run because his deck worked consistently enough that he was able to enact his strategies smoothly and frequently uh, with the four professors research. Now, Penny is a card that I think a lot of people will want to know about. Penny was here for two reasons. So Penny's here because of people playing Mawile. Uh, so we'll just pull up a deck with Mawile in it real quick. Pedro played it in his Lost Zone deck. Mawile has the Tempting Trap during your opponent's next turn. A defending Pokemon can't retreat, and it takes 90 more damage from attacks. Most of the time, that 90 more damage doesn't matter. It's just this is a colorless uh, retreat lock attack. And a deck like Lugia... Let's look at Lugia. Plays zero ways to switch their Pokemon. This one actually played Thornton, uh, so that's actually not a good example. But this Lugia list a little more, uh, a little more stereotypical. Zero ways to switch Pokemon. So if you can gust up their Luminion V and use Mawile's attack to lock it there and it can't retreat, that Luminion is stuck there for the rest of the game. Uh, and a deck like Pedro's uh, that has that Mawile in it also had Pidgeot V with Vanishing Wings. You can just put it on your bench and then shuffle it into your deck. So you guarantee that you will never deck out. Uh, so you will just use Tempting Trap Mawile until your opponent decks out. So Tord played, now going back to Tord's list, Tord played Penny because it counters that Mawile strategy. Um, if they mobile up your Radiant Greninja or your Manaphy or your Luminion, any of these Pokemon that you can't attack with in this deck, then you can just Penny it, pick it up, that, and and you're fine, you're good to go. But also, Penny doubled as a Lost Zone Mirage Gates tech because uh, Cresselia has 120 HP, so it could take a hit from Cramorant. Zacian can take a hit from Cramorant. It can also take a hit from Snorlax. Uh, it can take a hit from uh, Raikou, depending on bench sizes. It can take a hit from Sableye's Lost Mine. So Penny is also here because it can heal these Pokemon in the Lost Zone matchup and almost be as effective as an Emergency Jelly sometimes. Uh, so yeah, so Penny was there because uh, it protects you from losing to a Mawile which is very, you know, that's just very frustrating. You don't want to lose to a Mawile when you know other good players are going to be playing that Mawile to take advantage of people not countering the Mawile or not teching for that counter. So Tord prepared with the counter to the counter, but it also doubled as uh, a tool against Lost Zone decks. So I wanted to talk about Gudra V-Star as well. Uh, so here's Aiden's top eight list of Gudra. I think Gudra was good because... 
Lost Zone decks were poised to be one of the top decks, whether that's Sable Zard or whether that's Mirage Gate variants. Uh, Hasui and Gujar V-Star can be very good against them because of rolling iron, mitigating 80 damage next turn, and also because of uh, Moisture Star being able to heal, and Aiden played a Crystal Cave for some extra healing as well. I actually, though, want to look at Piper Lapine's 23rd place list. Uh, this played the Articuno with Wild Freeze. It does 70, damages Articuno, and paralyzes the defending Pokemon. This is another retreat locking option, and there's actually a lot of retreat locking options going on in this tournament because players identified that decks were being built without a way to switch. So you have Piper's Articuno paralyzing. You have the Mawiles in Lost Zone. You also had, uh, this is another really interesting one, Magnus Peterson's Urshifu deck, wherever that may be. We just looked at it a second ago here. Nope, that's a different person with the last name Peterson. Here we go, Magnus Peterson. Uh, played Carnivine with Big Bite, 30, and then the defending Pokemon can't retreat. Also playing Radiant Alakazam's Painful Spoons, so you can do 30, no retreat, and then next turn Painful Spoons, 20 of that damage to a different Pokemon. And keep that active Pokemon there for quite a while, uh, since you have Radiant Alakazam to move things, and then use Metacham's Yoga Loop to finally knock something out, and then go back into Carnivine uh, with the big bite to keep locking something in there in the active. So similar, similar thing, except you're actually going to be winning on prize cards probably instead of uh deck out like Pedro's list with the Pidgeot. So the next thing we should talk about is Duraludon, right? Uh, obviously Alex Shemansky won with Arceus Duraludon, but, uh, Trevor Reed top aided with Lugia with a one, one Duraludon and Eric Rodriguez top aided with a two, two Duraludon and Lugia. So Duraludon, there's a couple reasons why this happened. One, we could look at the well-performing Lugia lists from the late night events last week. So the the Lugia list that won the late night 87 and the late night 88, uh, if you look at these lists, they scoop to Duraludon VMAX. They literally scoop to Duraludon VMAX. None of their Pokemon can damage it. And a lot of players were going to net deck this version of Lugia. So Duraldon VMAX started becoming a very, very enticing card to play to just almost auto win against Lugia V-Star decks that were not prepared for the Duraldon. Uh, so you even saw Lugia players playing Duraldon VMAX, and this did two things. The Duraldon VMAX line was so valuable in Lugia for this event specifically, because it could be an auto win almost against other Lugias, and it also answered anybody trying to auto win against you with that Duraldon VMAX, just completely block you out of attackers uh, because of its skyscraper ability that says this Pokemon can't be damaged by Pokemon that have special energy attached. And it's GMAX pulverization that goes through all effects. So a Duraldon VMAX hits through a Duraldon VMAX. So this both countered Lugias without Duraldon, and it was a check against decks that were playing Duraldon to counter you. Uh, so those Duraludon VMAXs in the Lugia decks were so important, but then also, of course, Alex Shemansky, Michael Bergerak, and Joshua Frink, uh, top 64, top 16, and winning the event with this Arceus Duraludon list, focused on Arceus and Duraludon, but also Alolan Vulpix V-Star was a very important part of this deck with the Snow Mirage attack doing 160, and it's not affected by effects, so it goes through effects, it would swing through something like a Duraludon VMAX, and then... Uh, during your opponent's next turn, prevent all damage done to this Pokemon by attacks from Pokemon that have an ability. Now, of course, that would also be countered by Duraldon's GMAX Pulverization. And then the Silvery Snow Star 70x Pokemon V in play on your opponent's side. So really big bomb to just drop for a free attack. Do a whole lot of damage with that. Uh, but Alex and his crew weren't the only one playing Alolan Vulpix V-Star. Brayden and Elfer also played Alolan, v Alolan Vulpix V-Star. Alongside Espeon V Max and two Leafy Camo Ponchos. So you would put the Leafy Camo Poncho on either your Flying Pikachu or your Alone Vulpix V Star because they both apply a 
effects with attacks. So a flying Pikachu VMAX, a normal VMAX Pokemon, until it uses its attack, then it can't be hit by basics next turn. A lone Vulpix V-Star, very similar, except after it uses its attack, it can't be hit by Pokemon with abilities next turn. So many decks can just play Escape Rope and Boss to take care of that, whether that's a Lost <clears throat> a Lost Zone deck or Giratina Lost Zone or even Arceus Giratina. Now let's talk about Giratina Lost Zone and the reason for this leafy camo poncho and also for the espion v max so if you're playing against lost zone giratina they could rope boss uh the flying pikachu v max and use star requiem to knock it out because knocking out is uh or, or i'm sorry it can do that without the rope boss or it can rope boss uh and hit the flying pikachu v max for 280 so the espion v max with the solar revelation protects it from being knocked out with star requiem and the leafy camo poncho protects it from rope boss shenanigans or if you're playing against a deck that doesn't have rope you could just put these leafy camo ponchos on one of your uh one of your benched v max pokemon like an espion v max and just limit your board to a place where you have a low and v a low and vulpix v star in the active and espion v max on the bench with a camo poncho so it can't be Boster Serena or the same thing, but with a flying Pikachu V Max against an all basic stack. The highest placing Lost Zone variant was Sablezard. Um, Pedro Torres is a phenomenal player, and his deck was very well teched with that Mawile with Halucha to prepare for other Lost Zone decks. Pidgeot V along with that Mawile so you can never deck out, but also so you can bench this to use Far Seal Stone and then shuffle the Pidgeot V back into your deck, not having any double prizes on the board. Uh, so the Lost Zone Sablezard just looked so solid into Lost Zone Mirrors because it's a little bit simpler to play. It's more, uh, it's... It's more consistent at doing the same thing over and over because you're pretty much always trying to go Cramorant into Sableye into Charizard. Uh, so over the course of a really long tournament, I also think it would be easier to play than the Gates version. The highest placing version of the Gates was Tyler Matthews and Nick Moffat at 15th and 16th. Um, Tyler Matthews opted to play the Far Seal Stone version with Dragonite V, Aggressive Attackers, multiple lost vacuums so you can try to get that turn one seven cards in the loss zone and then nick moffitt played zero stones um but his list was kind of weird galarian moltres with double clara something that players have considered before for loss zone but it's never really picked up mainstream success also snorlax as an attacker kyogre with aqua storm to finish things off playing three energy recycler since old kyogre lists would play something like to recycler to rod um, and now you don't have rod anymore so you got the energy recycler as a third inclusion in there um, i'm not really too much of a fan of this deck but i see the thought process behind it all but yeah so far seal stone lost zone decks were the successive were the more successful version this week also sablezard was the most successful lost zone variant deck um, and then i also wanted to talk about mewtwo guardy versus regular guardy Honestly, Mewtwo Guardy has a higher ceiling, but I think regular Guardy is also strong enough to just get there. That's what, kind of what Torch showed us. Like, Guard, regular Gardevoir, Torch version, is uh, a little bit more consistent, a little less prone to bad prizing or bad discards or bad starting hands, but it also is very powerful with a double Zacian with Sky Seal Stone. Uh... And then Mewtwo, the Mewtwo version has a higher ceiling, it has a higher payoff, but it also takes a little longer to get there. The Mewtwo versions don't play rare candy. Um, and like I said, you have to fit these four pieces of Pokemon that don't do anything unless they're all together. And so just naturally, this deck is going to have a little bit more of uh, functionality issues, I think, but it does have a higher endgame ceiling. But... Torch showed that you really didn't need that higher end game ceiling to get far in the tournament placing second. So prior to the event, I would have said that I expected Mewtwo Guardy to do better than uh, regular Guardy, but uh, Tord proved us wrong. So that's really all I had to talk about today. Let me know if you enjoy this kind of uh, little 
post tournament metagame discussion and my insight on things. And also if you did enjoy it, but there were things that I left out, let me know if there's other stuff you'd like to see. Um, all this information is on limitlesstcg.com and please subscribe here because I do not have a thousand subs yet. So I cannot, uh, I cannot monetize this channel yet. And I really like to, so I appreciate the subscriptions. Um, yeah, thanks for watching.